This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 106, Brooklyn and Lorenzo Velasquez, Part 2. In the last episode, I told you the story of two-year-old Lorenzo Velasquez and his nine-month-old sister, Brooklyn, whose mother, Brittany, left them in a hot car all day while she worked a 12-hour shift. When she returned home, Brittany found her children dead in the car, and she was charged in their murder, later accepting a plea deal in exchange for a 20-year prison sentence. In this episode, you'll hear my conversation with Brittany's brother, Vincent Velasquez, who spoke openly and candidly about his younger sister's mental impairments, his family's efforts to save her children, and his memories of his tiny niece and nephew. This is part two of the heartbreaking story of Brooklyn and Lorenzo Velasquez. No lengthy intro today. Vincent's willingness to discuss his family's tragedy in the hopes of preventing other children from meeting a similar fate to that of his niece and nephew is admirable, and I hope you find our discussion as illuminating as I did. Thanks so much for joining me today, Vincent. Yeah, no problem. I really appreciate it. I've followed your uh, niece and nephew's story for a few years now, and um, I realize that we're coming up on four years now. Yeah, four years. Yeah, and just about a week, I think. So I definitely wanted to make sure that I devoted a whole episode to them because they've had a piece of my heart for a while. So I really appreciate you coming on and talking about them. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're doing a nice thing with your podcast and everything. And I've always been willing to talk with anyone or spread awareness. You know, even if one family member sees something similar happening or, you know, and it leads to one kid being saved or, you know what I mean, then then it's all worth it. Yep, that's pretty much it. It's uh, it's so hard. Some people just don't know the signs to look for. And it looks like you guys had an awful lot of signs and you did everything you could to try to avoid this, but it just happened anyway. So I'm yeah. so sorry. You know, you guys have been through a lot. Yeah, the whole thing was shocking to say the least. But then again, not because, you know, we knew this would be an inevitable thing that was going to happen. But, you know, you never really think it's actually going to happen until it does. So and I've had people ask me, like, hey, how do you feel? And I said, well, um, do you have a sibling? Yes. Okay. well, how would you feel if your sibling that you're really close to caused the death of their two children? Oh, then, you know, it kind of puts it into perspective because whenever you hear stories on the news, there's always a disconnect because you don't know the person. So when you tell them, you know, just picture your sister or your brother with their children that they have, your niece and nephew, and imagine one day in the middle of the night getting a call saying that they killed them. Just picture that. That's how it feels. I can't imagine what you guys have all been through. Both of your grandparents must have been very resilient people and extremely strong to deal with some of Brittany's issues from a young age. That's so hard for any parent to deal with, but especially since they were, what, in their 60s by then. Yeah, and at that point, I mean, we grew up in a small town. There wasn't a whole lot of support, a whole lot of groups, you know, and mental health to this day is still, it's not taken as serious as it should but when you're in a small town, you know, and there's not a whole lot of awareness on those things. And, you know, they just say, oh, Bernie's just a bad kid, you know, just misbehaves. My brother, Gabe, you know, he has mental health issues. That's obvious. But when you talk to Brittany, you know, she sounds extremely intelligent. But, you know, when it comes time to going to school or doing anything like that, she just couldn't commit to anything. And for them, you know, they didn't really know what to do. Did you guys all grow up in the house on Richard Avenue there? 
We did. And actually quite a few people actually grew up in that house. You know, when you see TV, when they send the kids off to like boot camp or, you know, something like that. So whenever there was distant relatives or cousins, kind of like the bad kids, they were sent to my grandparents' house because my grandfather owned a business and he would put the kids to work, show them a work ethic, kind of discipline them, you know, in a loving way. They were very loving in their discipline, which sounds weird, but they were never spanked any of us. I I mean, we deserved it sometimes, but <laughs> um, they just had a really good way of getting through to you to get you to shape up. And literally every single night uh, before we we're going to bed, my grandpa would just sit outside on the porch when my grandma's watching Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune you know, his entertainment was just sit outside and maybe a neighbor would walk over and talk or me or my siblings would go outside and he'd kind of give us a heart to heart talk. Well, he definitely sounds like he did the best he could. And your grandma, too. They seem to do a lot. Actually, all of us are relatively normal, I think. <laughs> I always say there's no such thing as a normal brain. We're all crazy in our own way, you know, but I think we're all relatively normal. So as far as Brittany, though, what was it, 17 different programs you tried to put her in and, and she would escape? Yeah. So it got to the point where it was lockdown facilities. You know, she could be put in a facility seven hours away and six hours later, she's home. It's like, how does that how does that happen? She would take cabs, trick people into giving her a ride near the house and then she'd jump out and run. And then the cab or whatever, whoever gave her a ride would then call the police and they would immediately know who it was. Oh, right. Small town. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so she was becoming a liability for everyone. So they eventually just pretty much said that if she gets out of our facility and gets hurt on the way home, then we're at fault for it. So they pretty much started refusing to take her in. One of the craziest ones, I think she was in the backside of Prescott in the middle of nowhere in some facility. And she was back home that night. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> my grandma always made a joke. She's like, Yeah, they had lions around there and she still got out. <laughs> you know, they could have had a moat with crocodiles and she would have just rode one home. Well, she sounds clever, that's for sure. She Oh, very, absolutely clever. It, it's weird though, because like I said, she sounds extremely intelligent when you talk to her. But when you when you need any sort of information or anything where if you say, Hey, what's ten plus ten? She'll say, uh, fifteen. You know, so that's also in part, I think, to never going to school. In prison, she ended up getting her GED and she's doing relatively well for herself in there. But, you know, outside of prison, she never really learned anything. And when they were able to keep her in school, she didn't excel all that well. She was always in fights and being a typical bad kid. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's just really weird. She just said the wildest things. Uh, and he said, that makes no sense. Literally anything that takes any sort of knowledge that you would have learned, she just didn't know it. But like I said, you could talk to her and she sounds extremely intelligent. Like when the whole incident happened, you know, even some family members who would talk to her on the phone or who just, you know, would come in contact with her at certain family events, stuff like that. She sounds intelligent. So when the time came for this incident, you know, no one could fathom how it could have been an accident. You talk to an, an intelligent sounding person, you just can't imagine something an accident to that magnitude, you know, such negligence and carelessness, you just can't imagine that to happen. And I think that's how it is a lot of times. So talking to her my whole life, there's weird things you pick up on. So the things they talk about, uh, the way they talk, and I didn't know I was picking up on it at the time, but when I talk to people or come in contact with certain people, I always tell my girlfriend, I say, well, oh, they remind me just of Brittany. You know, not in the way of they're going to, you know, cause their children to die, but in a way of their mental health, you know, I can just tell. It's just really weird being able to see the same properties in other people just by having a small conversation with them, which is a good thing. It takes a lot to report someone to Child Protective Services. You know, it could be a neighbor or a sister, you know, your own parent, you know, even me with my sister, the very first time I did, it was pretty tough. You know, she 100% needed to be reported. And even then that was tough. Yeah, of course. It's someone you care about. Yeah. Getting people to report it, you know, stuff like that is part of it. You know, at least start there saying, Hey, if you know, if you see something a little weird, you know, maybe say something or talk to, you know, other people who know them, see if anyone else sees it. 
and then uh, go from there. But regarding, you know, actual child protective services, I mean, I don't know if there's any legislature that can be done, but, you know, I've seen them take children for allegations of other things. And I know, like with my sister, there was no proof she ever actually abused the kids, nor do I think she did. But, you know, when I call and they say, well, there's, are there any bruises? No, but this is exactly what's going to happen. I'm telling you right now. And they say, well, that's your opinion. That's an allocation. I said, well, whose opinion matters more than the person who's known them their whole life? You know, for someone to build up the courage to call and make an accusation like that, you know, at least they could do a follow up. And then they would, you know, they'd go over there and, you know, she'd clean her apartment. And like I said, she sounds extremely intelligent. So all they would say is, are you abusing your kids? No. Do you have a job? Yes. Although it's her 10th job in the last 10 months, mm-hmm. you know, the kids are all dirty, but kids are dirty. So, you know, no one really says anything about that, but, and then she'd kind of trick them. But I think it needs to get to a point where maybe they should say, okay, well, there's a few allegations that well, with my sister, there's a plethora of allegations. So maybe take it a little more serious, not just wait for the kid to get hurt. You know, maybe do some preventative measures. So it seems like with stuff like that, they only step in after the kid has already been traumatized and hurt. And I don't know, like I said, it's it's all accusations at a certain point. And that's that's how they're always going to see it. But maybe, you know, when you have more than two accusations of mental health issues, maybe say, hey, we're not going to take your children away, but you need to go get an evaluation. And if you refuse to, you know, then we'll take separate measures there. But if you do go get tested and they say you're fine, then, you know, uh, we're going to take the professional's word over it rather than your neighbor or your sister. But if the professional does say, yeah, this person is has so many different issues, then take proper steps from there. Like say, hey, OK, in order to keep your children, you need to start doing certain things that the therapist says or psychiatrists or doctors, you know, if they recommend medication or therapies or anything like that, keep up with it. So and if you start falling off then they can take further action of taking the children or something like that. But I mean, if you have mental issues to where people are saying it's not a bad thing to get treated. No, not at all. Yeah. So to force parents to get treated after it's been proven, I don't see that as a bad thing. So Brittany and Chris Miranda married when she was pretty young. When did they actually meet or when did they they get together? So they were on and off for a while. Uh, my sister then lived with him and his parents when she was pretty young. Uh, I'm not entirely sure the whole timeline. I was in college at this time. So I was a little disconnected, but I would hear the gossip from my grandmother about it or the complaints. But before the children or before the her daughter she had with him, she was abused by him. Yeah, there was quite a bit of abuse. A lot. Well, she changed the baby's name from Christopher to Lorenzo because of domestic issues, or at least that's what she wrote on the paperwork. So her son is not from Christopher. She got pregnant by another guy in Superior who is actually a great guy. But she's been on and off with Chris at this time and then got with Chris. And when she had her son, who was obviously the oldest... She was with Chris at the time, so she named him after Chris, even though Chris was not the father. And then, you know, he was abusive. And then she ended up having his actual child, Brooklyn. And then, you know, he was still abusing her. He ended up passing away. She must have had some change of heart to where, you know, she realized that the man her son was named after was not the best father figure. Not to give the guy a bad word, you know, he's not here to defend himself. But from what I hear, I know he did abuse her. I'm not saying he's a bad person or friend or brother. You know, he may have been an amazing brother. You know, he may have been an amazing best friend. But as a spouse, he wasn't a good spouse. And that's what I tell people all the time. You may like a guy a lot, but at home, he may be a monster. Exactly. And I know his siblings loved him and adored him. Like I said, he may he may have been an amazing brother. Um, I've even seen him one time. It, it was when he was broke up with my sister for a while, pretty early in the relationship. I seen him at a restaurant. At, ironically, it was actually the restaurant that my sister was working at when her children died. Oh, wow. Uh, obviously, this is way before my sister worked there or anything, before she was even pregnant. Um, I seen him there with his daughter. They walked there and he seemed like an incredible dad to her because I knew who he was. So, now, so I was kind of just watching 
His daughter seemed super happy. He was very loving to her, you know, so he was a great dad to her. So I, I can't put any ill words towards him in that regard. But as a spouse, you know, he was very toxic. You just never know, really. You know, like you said, you can someone could be just wonderful in public and to everyone else in their life. But to their spouse, it's an absolutely different person. And that's the hard part to make people on the outside to understand as well. So how did she take his death? I mean, that must have been tough. I think they were together at the time. They were split up. They were legally married still. So when she made Facebook posts saying my husband died in the background, we didn't say anything to her, but we were all saying, you know, he was extremely abusive and she left him and is in the middle of trying to get legally divorced. But her mental issues uh, made her love Facebook attention. She absolutely loved it. Everything she lived for was for the next Facebook post or Snapchat picture or, you know, stuff like that. So, which a lot of people do that nowadays, but hers was... Uh, in an unhealthy way. So I can see where she was trying to play the victim of his death, you know, saying, oh, I'm a widow now. So she played sad. I mean, I'm assuming she was sad, but she was definitely overdoing a lot of the public stuff. Did she change the baby's name with the family or did everyone continue to call him Christopher? Or how did that all come about? So it was really weird. She was in the middle of changing his name when he died from Christopher to Lorenzo. And I know his name was changed to Lorenzo partially, but uh, I know it wasn't on the birth certificate yet. So no one called him Christopher or Lorenzo. He had a little nickname, Aki. My sister's fiance, I forgot what he said. So I think there was like a puppet named Ahmed uh, who had a really big forehead. Okay. And... My sister's son had a really big forehead. We always said he was top heavy because he was always falling flat on his face. Oh. Um, you know, we we're just playing with him. You know, he's a child. So he used to call him Aki for Ahmed. Uh, oh. <laughs> and then it got to the point where everyone just called him that. So when he died, I remember we were at the funeral home and they were saying, okay, so what was his name? What do you want to put on the headstone? Like, what was his legal name? And we, were, we all just looked at each other. And he was so confused. He's like, why are you guys looking at that? What's his name? We're like, he's got two legal names right now, which we don't call him either. And what we call him is Aki. So he's got like three names. Wow. So yeah, it was confusing. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, it was pretty funny, but Aww. yeah, so that's his name. <laughs> it is Lorenzo, but yeah. What ended up going on the headstone? Lorenzo was on the headstone. And of course, that was after your grandpa. Yes. So you had said that uh, CPS was involved a lot, but they never really did much. I mean, did they at least offer her some kind of services or? I don't know exactly what CPS offered her or now DCS. They changed the name because it, it was a horrible system in Arizona. So many lawsuits and everything, a bad handling. So they changed it to DCS to kind of wipe everything under the rug. But at the time it was CPS. I do know she was offered free daycare for both children, um, but I, I think that was just a state-funded program that she applied for. I don't think that was offered by CPS. But other than that, they never really did much. I remember the very first time I called, the woman I talked to was very hard to talk to, very rude, very demeaning, condescending, very weird. And like I said, it takes a lot of courage to call CPS on someone. And when you do build up the courage and when you're talking to someone on there who, you know, makes you uncomfortable to even keep talking, you know, I can also see where people wouldn't call again or stuff like that. But I was telling the, the person, I said, you know, my sister has all these mental issues and she's very accusational saying I'm making it up. Are you just making this up? No. Well, is there any proof? Well, no, because she's been in all these mental institutions and escapes every time. And since she's under 18, they can't really, they can't like lock her up or anything. And, you know, it's hard to properly diagnose under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So she's like, well, without a diagnosis, there's nothing we can do about that. Which, you know, that, um, that may be a policy issue and that may be a thing. But to completely disregard everything I was saying, you know, I would tell her everything I've seen. You know, I even said, Brittany can see a homeless person sitting there or anyone and if she had to go in the store, she would just say, hey, can you watch my child real fast? Oh, my gosh. She would just go to Walmart. We didn't know this, but she would lock the kids in the car at Walmart. One time, uh, my sister had a friend with her, and they were going to go in Walmart. And she was like, hey, aren't we bringing Brooklyn? She's like, no, I'm just going to leave her in here just for a few minutes. She's like, no, you don't leave your kid in the car just for a few minutes. 
What are you doing? What if your car gets stolen? What if it's hot? Like she just turned it off and locked it. Uh, I think it was winter in Arizona, but still like right now I'm sitting in my car and it's barely in the low seventies and the car's off and it's hot. My sister's friend immediately contacted us and said, Hey, your sister did this without questioning it in front of me. So I can't imagine how often she does this to be this comfortable doing it in front of someone. So we had a talk with Brittany. You know, we told her this is bad. You know, what are you doing? But with Brittany, when she finds something that works, whether it be a lie or a tactic to get out of something or anything, she doesn't see anything else happening. I remember the very first time she had the kids in the car, she actually accidentally locked her son in the car. She closed her door, was walking to the other side, and he was locked in the car. And she freaked out, immediately called 911 and broke the window and got him out. So it's like at one point she did know it was bad. But then a time came where she, you know, maybe was like, okay, I got to go in the gas station. I don't feel like carrying him. I'm just going to leave him in the car. And it worked. So it escalated to where, you know, who knows? She could have been leaving him in the car for two hours while she's grocery shopping at Walmart. And then there were stories where she would meet up with, say, a guy. You know, when she's in between relationships, she already has her son. She'd drive to another town. It's nighttime. So she would leave the baby in the car, you know, and it was working. But it's nighttime, you know, so it's not so bad. And there were times when she'd come inside, uh, my grandma called and she was like, Hey, Brittany came inside today and it's nighttime, but the kids were so sweaty. What do you think that's about? And we didn't realize she was leaving in the car. We're like, what the heck? That's weird. Maybe they're sick. Maybe running fevers. Yeah, who knows? You know, maybe they're playing, but you know, my daughter plays a lot and she barely even sweats. You know, these kids were young and it's nighttime, you know, and they're asleep. You know, she brings them in asleep, sweating. So I I think at the time, since no one told us before that she was leaving in the car, you don't really jump to that conclusion. Oh, your child's sweating. You must have left him in the car all night. No one does that. So like that doesn't come to mind. Now, in hindsight, it completely makes sense. But times when we knew she was going to the other town to meet the guy, she would take her son with him. And then they reached out to him after. And he was saying those times I'd never even seen her son. So then we're like, well, then where was the son? And then she would say, oh, he, he was at a babysitter. And they would contact the babysitter. We never watched that kid. What are you talking about? So it all boils down to she was leaving him in the car. We'd, we're assuming she didn't lock him outside of the car or in an alley. You know what I mean? You know, it was becoming a habit and it was working. And it just so happened to be when she was doing it, it was at night or in the daytime. It was only a few minutes while she's in the store. So then nothing bad ever happened. So in her mind, nothing bad ever will happen. So when this happened, she went to work and didn't think twice about leaving them in there for the day. Yeah. So obviously her stories at the beginning were completely false. (laughs) You know, she had a few other lies saying this girl was watching them. I didn't put them in the car. Someone was watching them or my grandma and grandpa were watching them, you know, a a bunch of things. And then what we're 99 percent sure is the case is. It was actually her first day at the job. She left her apartment, moved in with my grandparents. Uh, Her car was still full of stuff. Her car that she drove to work. And my grandma was like, hey, we've been watching the kids all week for you while you were moving. Can you just please get a babysitter? She was about to have a very long shift, like a 13-hour shift. Wow, for her first shift. Yeah. She worked from like 9 a.m. to like 11 p.m. So they said, hey, we can't really watch these kids all day like that. Can you find a babysitter or a friend? Like, we're exhausted. We watch them all week. So she called her friend and her friend said, no, she can't watch them. So Brittany is saying, okay, well, my only babysitter can't watch them. Like five minutes before she needs to watch them. She's not here. I think she was actually out of town, but I'm, I'm not sure on that part. So in her mind, knowing Brittany, what happened was she said, okay, Every single day, almost 9 a.m. comes around 930. My grandfather would drive to the store, drive to the gas station, grab some coffee and grab the newspaper. So in her mind, she was saying, "Okay, I don't feel like being yelled at right now. You know, she's always doing something stupid to get yelled at. Like, hey, what are you doing? Like, that's not right. So instead of walking back inside and saying, hey, I'm sorry, I don't have a babysitter. And, you know, I'm saying, you know, okay, we'll just leave him here. But don't do that again. She was like, well, I don't want to deal with that right now. So I'm just going to leave him in the car. When grandpa comes out in like 30 minutes, he'll see the kids and be like, ah, Brittany, what did you do? We're just going to watch the kids then. And then when she gets home, then she probably assumed she was just going to get yelled at or, you know, scolded or something told, you know, why would you do that? We ended up having to watch him and then all would be normal and fine. 
But, you know, what happened was she put the kids in the car. My grandfather was really sick that weekend. He didn't leave the house. She leaves him in the car around 9 a.m., goes to work, comes back at 11. She walks inside and says, hey, where's the kids? And they're like, what do you mean, where's the kids? We thought you had a babysitter. She's like, oh, crap. And then she runs out, and that's when they find him in the car. They were in the car all day in the heat. I think the high that day was maybe mid 80s to 90s, but they were saying uh, the car could have gone to like 130 degrees inside still with direct sun beating on it all day. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah, man, I had to when I was talking to the detectives and reading the reports and, you know, seeing the crime scene photos, you know, going over it with them to try to figure out what happened. Man, I would not want to repeat some of the details of what happened in that car of those kids. So her son was trying to get out. She locked him in because in her mind is like, that was her doing it responsibly. I'm going to lock the car. So like, they don't just wander around outside Mm -hmm. uh, until my grandpa comes in. So she locked him in the car. He got out of his car seat. He's crying, trying to get out. He doesn't know how to unlock the car. Uh, I guess their car, when it's locked, some cars, when it's locked and you pull the handle, it unlocks it. But my grandparents' car didn't do that. Okay. Uh, I know a lot of newer cars. They, They had a newer Nissan. It was an SUV. I know a lot of newer vehicles, yeah, like when it's locked and you pull the handle, it doesn't unlock it. You have to actually grab the lock and unlock it or hit the unlock button. Yeah, there's other details of him trying to get out that I just won't say. They're pretty horrific of how he was trying to get out. And then he was trying to unbuckle his sister. It's a very horrific scene. And anyone with kids or is close to a child has a niece or nephew that they love you know, when, when you see the things that this little boy was trying to do, you can only imagine the struggle that was in there, the heat. They're helpless. You know, they don't know what's happening. They just know it's 130 degrees and they're literally cooking in there. Even the detectives were saying certain things like I've never in my life thought I would see something like this. It was bad. I give a lot of credit to those first responders, the things they have. Oh, to geez. Do. And speaking of first responders, they were throughout the whole thing. They were always on our side. So they knew, obviously, it's a small town. They know how Brittany is. The police called CPS on her. The police say, hey, call CPS and we'll vouch for you. You know, like, this is going to end bad. Sometimes there'd be days where we didn't know where Brittany was or things like that. And we'd call them and, you know, they would set up, like, stakeouts, trying to find out where she is, literally just to check on the children. The Superior Police Department did that, or countless calls to the fire department of my grandma saying, oh, you know, the boy fell and hurt himself. I don't, can you come check on him? Or my grandma would call the fire department or whatever, like, hey, Brittany hasn't come home. Like, what should we do? She's been gone for a week, stuff like that. So it was pretty well known in the town. The fire department guys, the medics, the police, they all knew this was going to happen. So when it did happen... Man, everyone was so mad. I mean, obviously, even if you didn't know it was going to happen, if two children pass away, you're going to be mad and sad. But they were they took it almost as bad as we did. You know, they were trying to help those children. They knew the children already. All these calls and trying to help them. And, and then it just all that for nothing. I mean, I remember the funeral. All the police department was there. All the fire department was there. Uh, they were all in there giving us hugs. They gave us an escort over there. All the police officers were saluting the car when we drove by. It was almost like it was their kids, too. You know what I mean? So it was a good way for the community to come together in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, it it sucks that it had to happen. But everyone was just so supportive. But with that being said, you know, a lot of big city responders, you know, you go to a call. You've never met this person in your life. You'll probably never see them again. You know, you get probably hundreds of calls a day, always from someone different or could go to a different department in a different part of the city. But those guys and girls, they knew these kids, you know, and everyone knows each other. They know my sister. They know my grandparents. They know us. So not only did they feel bad for the children, you know, they felt bad for my grandparents because of the help they were trying to get with it. Uh, They knew the kids. They had to go in there and see the scene. It was horrific. I wasn't there. I remember I was at home asleep. So mind you, she got off at 11 p.m., Goes to the gas station, does a few things. And then I think all this starts unraveling and family members started getting calls that it happened around midnight. But I always sleep with my phone on do not disturb or on vibrate because, I mean, I work a lot. So finally, for some reason, I woke up. It was probably like three or four in the morning. I just checked my phone to see what time it was. I think it was like 100 missed calls, all kinds of texts. 
uh, my good buddy Benny started calling me when I was looking at my phone. So I answered. He's like, Vince, you need to get to Superior now. Mind you, I lived probably an hour and a half away. So I said, well, well, what happened? He's like, just get to Superior now. I was like, well, just tell me what happened. He said, well, out of respect, he's like, I don't want to tell you over the phone. Like, you got to get here now. I was like, well, just tell me, did my grandpa die? Is he okay? He's like, no, your grandpa's fine. And I was like, is my grandma okay? He's like, yeah, she's fine. I was like, is my brother Gabe okay? He's like, yeah. He's like, just get to Superior now. I was like, well, I'm an hour and a half away. Just tell me what it is. So I'm not driving there. All these missed calls and no one's telling me what's going on. I have no idea what I'm about to walk into. He's like, okay, well, I'm sorry I'm telling you this over the phone. It's horrible. He's like, but Brittany's kids are dead. I'm laying there. It's three in the morning in bed. Uh, my daughter's mom, she's already awake. So she can hear everything he's saying. So she just starts freaking out like, what? What? We always thought this could happen. And going back to CPS, I literally even told them, I was like, these kids are going to be found dead. And they would say, okay, well, nothing we can do about it. I think it was weeks after that this happened. But anyway, so it was a weird feeling because anyone else who would get this call hearing their niece and nephew have died, I don't know how a normal person would feel. You know, no one knows how they take tragedy, how they're going to take tragedy. No one knows how they're going to react to getting that call, you know, because most normal niece and nephews are treated fine. Normally, I was obviously sad because my niece and nephew have passed away. But it was like instant anger and flashbacks. I was so mad. I wasn't even surprised. It was a weird feeling like, like before surprise hit me, obviously sadness. It was like, oh my God, it actually happened. But then like instant after that, it was like anger. And I was extremely mad. You know, we've been telling everyone for so long, please help. It was a very confusing feeling. You know, I'm saying I'm supposed to be just sad right now, but I was like, I am extremely mad. Like my madness was overtaking the sadness. It was very weird. So finally I was like, well, what happened? Obviously they didn't know at the time, but what my sister said trying to save her butt was I left him with the babysitter. I don't know what happened. You know, I left him with this girl and I'm not sure what happened. That's what she kept telling everyone. And then, so they bring that girl in and that girl's like, I've never watched these kids. I'm pretty sure is what she said. And obviously she had an alibi. She's a kid probably 14 or 15. Her parents like, literally, those kids are not here. This is what we did today. You know, obviously, if the kids died in their care and, you know, they come to my grandparents' house and drop the kids off, they're going to lie. But it was pretty easy to find that, you know, they were actually telling the truth. So then they come back to Brittany and they say, well, okay, well, what happened? We know this girl was not watching the kids. She said, oh, well, my grandparents were watching them. They're questioning everyone. You know, it's this long interview process. I'm not sure everything that's happening. Obviously, I wasn't part of it. I don't know what questions were asked. I don't know. I know there was a lot of lies, a lot of accusations on Brittany's part. And everyone else's story was the same. My grandpa said, I don't know. She went to work. We told her to get a babysitter. And she showed up at 11 o'clock at night, asked where the kids were, said, oh, crap. And then ran in with two lifeless bodies of children. To them, that's all they seen. Right. And speaking of which, so obviously within hours, helicopters everywhere. Every news station was here reporters everywhere. So we took my grandparents to my sister's house because no one knew where my sister lived in Mesa, 30 minutes away. So took them there so they can, you know, just have some grief in private, you know, and then all of us kind of congregated at my sister's house and my grandpa's just sitting out back. And I remember I go out there and this was the first I've seen him. And he's just kind of sitting there quietly. And uh, he, he was always kind of a reserved person uh, who knows what to say to someone who's just gone through that. So I just kind of sat there, just sat next to him. We were kind of just both looking out on the back porch. It was the morning at this time, you know, sun coming up. He was just crying. And the first thing I said was like, I'm sorry, Grandpa, for your loss. Because to him, they were like his kids. That little boy would follow him everywhere. <laughs> that was like his little son. Like, what do you say to someone? So I was just sitting there with him. And we just kind of sat there. And I think like an hour went by and we were just sitting there. I think we were both just kind of replaying everything in our head, just being next to each other. They always said I was his favorite as well. So because I, I took on his trade, I was always working with him outside from a young age. I was like his buddy as well, the one following him around. So um, I think just being next to him was all I could do at the time. So we kind of just both sat there and then we started talking and, you know, he was just in such shock. Like, why? Like, why did this happen? What? And he was like, what happened? Because he was so confused. He heard so many stories. 
then I was like, well, can you tell me what happened on your end? And, and that's when he told me the story of Brittany came home. I was asleep already. And I hear my grandma yelling. I hear everyone yelling and I come out. It's just a crazy scene. And it was confusing too, because when you die in a car, the heat, it causes blood vessels to break in your head. So there was blood everywhere. He thought Brittany was like in a car accident or, you know, so there was just blood everywhere. And he was like, what? And they're just looking at him to do something. And he told me, he said, well, I remember when your uncle Choppy died and his wife who found him ran over because they actually lived across the street when it happened. His wife ran over when she found him. My grandpa went over there. And when you touch a lifeless body, I guess, it you know, it's just cold, stiff. And he said, I remember what my grandma was looking at my grandpa saying, you know, do something. Everyone's looking at him to do something. You know, at this point, 911's been called, you know, all that. But what do you do? He's like, I started to give him CPR. He said, but do you know what it's like to give CPR to a lifeless body? He said, you blow into their mouth and cold air blows right back out to you. Oh, my God. He's like, I wouldn't want anyone to experience that to their own son's lifeless body. But he just kept doing it because he didn't want people to think he didn't try. He also didn't want to think he didn't try because, you know, maybe he could come back, you know. But, you know, he said it was so unnatural feeling. He's like, just cold air blew back at me. And he said, when I ran out there and your sister had them, he's like, as soon as I touched Aki, he's like, I knew it because I felt it before. But everyone, he said, again, was looking at him, expecting him to do something. So he said he did what he did before. He said he just started crying and blew into a little boy's mouth and cold air blew right back out to him, but with blood and stuff like that. And, and everyone's crying. He's like, they're gone. And they're like, just do something, do something. And, you know, he's giving them both CPR. I couldn't imagine. He loved that little boy like it was his son. You know, literally, my grandpa would be outside working on the car and that little boy would be out there. And he was literally attached to my grandpa's hip. So, I mean, just my grandpa talking about this. You know, I, I couldn't imagine like now, you know, with my daughter and stuff like I couldn't imagine doing that to someone I didn't love, you know, but then doing that to someone who is your child, you know, you, you it's physically impossible to love anyone or anything more than you love your child. You you won't love your parents more than you love your child. And to them, you know, their great grandchild was their child. It was a rough day. And it feels like it was yesterday. We were talking the other day, me and my sister, and we were like, man, it's been almost four years. Seems like it was just yesterday. It's just weird. Like, it seems like it's just ingrained in our mind. Like, it hasn't faded. You know, I still remember all the calls I made. I still remember every interview I did, where I was. Probably forever, that's how I'll, I'll remember it. For something that traumatic, I'm sure it's going to stay with you. Yeah, Absolutely. But time goes on, and my grandfather now died. He's buried next to them. Also, it was a big debacle, too, when we were at the funeral home because they were like, well, do you guys have two plots? And we are like, well, could we bury them together? Because they were attached at the hip to the little boy and the baby. Yeah, I bet. Uh, he loved that little girl so much. And we were like, can they be buried together? And like, the funeral home director was like, honestly, I've never had that request, so I don't even know if that's legal. He said, I know in some places they can be buried on top of each other, like two caskets mm -hmm. and come to find out it wasn't legal or like there was some weird legalities and weird things like loopholes you had to do. So they called some pretty high up lawmaker or someone. Uh, it got really high up in the Arizona government and they were, they finally just said, you know what? Just do it. Just bury them together because it wasn't a money issue. We weren't trying to save on the price of two caskets. Yeah, those kids only knew each other the whole life as their siblings. They lived together. They died together. You know, why not let them be buried together? So we went and bought little outfits for them, which is pretty emotional. And then they interlocked their hands in the casket. So they were holding hands. And Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty sad sight. It was pretty rough. And we had to do it in secrecy, too, because a lot of people, you know, had good intentions, wanted to show their support. But uh, we had our own viewing had our own little ceremony the night before I'd like an everyone was trying to find out the location. Uh, so they gave a fake location and then in private, you know, we all came up with a location at a different funeral home so that we had our privacy. There weren't news reporters outside people trying to take pictures through the windows or, you know, just privacy and no one, no one found out. No one was there. So we, you know, our family got together. Obviously my grandparents were heartbroken, but of course. Yeah. 
seeing two little babies like that in a casket, it was just shocking. And then their funeral, it's really weird because I was at this point, so much has happened. You know, I had to help with everything because my grandparents, they're so heartbroken and old. We don't expect them to plan everything. So, you know, me and my siblings, we had to arrange for everything on top of not only arranging the funeral, but, you know, arranging for family members to come and then working with detectives and police officers and investigators and a million calls and trying to keep up with all the interviews. Uh, it was just such a, it was like a blink of an eye. It was gone the whole week. And like I said, the whole time, I was still just mad because in the meantime, five or six interviews a day, and I bring up, like literally weeks ago, I told CPS these kids are going to be found dead. Trying to get it through their head, like do something. You know, I was just so angry. You know, it was almost hard to grieve when you're that mad. Uh, so the funeral came around and uh, they told me to give the eulogy. So I did, but it was, it was a weird feeling. Like I still couldn't get over my anger. You know, I, I don't know what people will expect to see, but if you see an uncle giving a eulogy, and there's two lifeless children right there. You know, you'd expect sobbing or something, but I just, man, it was just so weird. Like, I just couldn't. Like, I mean, obviously I was crying, you know, showing, you know, shedding tears. It was sad. Like, I was just so mad still that, you know, giving the eulogy, it was more of anger that I was trying not to show still. And I didn't even write the speech until the night before. I just wrote it on my phone a little bit, just some talking points. I just showed the story of their life, the story of my grandparents. And then uh, at the beginning, I made sure to thank all the police department, all the fire department. Because like I said, it was I didn't know they were going to be there. And they were all there crying, you know, because they knew the kids like their own. Yeah. And honestly, it's still a blur. I don't even remember what I said. I just talked. It's still a blur. I don't know what I said. Um, I don't remember any of it. After the funeral, after everything was over, nothing's really back to normal until you're back at work. So I remember my first day back at work was a little weird because obviously it's the first time I've seen everyone and it's like this wild story all over the country. And then the second day when no one asked me about it, I'm just working and in my head, it's just going through and I'm like, it's done. Like Brittany's locked up. The kids are gone. You know, like there's nothing to plan anymore. I mean, obviously court trials and all that, but it finally hit me. And then I just had to leave. I was just like so emotional that day. It all just hit me. You know, like no time to grieve the whole week, you know, out of anger. And finally, I just let all the anger go. And it was just overwhelming. It's a process normally. And, and the situation for you wasn't the normal grieving process at all because you had a good reason to be angry. Yeah, absolutely. And not only just the anger, but, you know, all the responsibility put on me, the anger. It just makes for a, a horrible time to try and grieve. Sure. You know, you just like turn into a robot, no sleep. And it was very hard to sleep. I don't even know how I slept. I think I just eventually got just so tired that my body just like shut down, you know, maybe two or three hours of sleep just because my body forced it on me. And then, you know, then I'm up and trying to plan the day, making calls. It was just crazy. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, like my grandpa would say. It's it's too much for anyone to take, but your whole family had to endure it all and, and after everything else that everyone has been through, it's just, it's an awful lot. I'm so sorry you guys had to go through this and that you saw it coming and did everything you could to prevent it. But even so, it happened anyway. Yeah. And I mean, to this day, the anger is subsided a little. But when I think about it, remembering the calls and remembering how that woman talked to me. And I remember at first CPS came out and, you know, said, hey, you know, we did everything we could by the book. You know, there's nothing else we could have done. And then I remember... After I started telling people like, hey, you know, just listen to these calls. Listen how they talk to us. I told the detectives, I said, request the calls and let the calls out to the public and see what people think. If they did everything they could, release the calls. And then CPS got back to us and said, actually, now that we listen to the calls, we're going to cooperate as much as we can. You know, if you, at first they were refusing to cooperate. You know, they said, you know, at the time, those were different incidents. But after they listened to the calls and I think they're like, oh, wow. OK, this. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is actually bad. So they actually never released the calls. Well, I've actually I'd like to hear it again. But I mean, if it went to trial, I'm sure the calls would have won out. But since my sister agreed to a plea agreement, which is another thing. So it's a completely different topic. But at the time, obviously, it's a small town. So everyone's still mad. Finally, two years later, year and a half later, 
things are starting to come to an end. Like, hey, we're going to go to trial. But, you know, everyone knew Brittany had mental issues. So the state is going to order a mental evaluation. The prosecutor is going to order a mental evaluation. The defense is going to order a mental evaluation. And everyone thinks, okay, the defense is going to say she has a lot of mental issues. The prosecution mental examiner, everyone assumes, would maybe say, you know, she's fit to stand trial. Obviously, the unbiased one should be the state one. But it came back where everyone was like, hey, uh, this girl's got some issues. And talking to the prosecutor, I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but um, they never, I don't think they told me not to. Um, But it basically was like, hey, she spent almost two years in prison. If this goes to trial and they find that she is mentally unfit and this was all just an accident, which it is, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we all know it wasn't murder. Right. Um, he's like, she was hit with first degree murder at first. They already dropped it to second degree murder. They don't want to drop it again or else nothing we say is going to hold up after we keep dropping the charges. Cause then the jury's say, well, they keep dropping them. Maybe we should reconsider. So prosecutor said, look, here's a, a high possibility of what can happen. She can be let out and they say time served. She gets sent to a mental institution for a year and she's on like a mandatory watch thing for a little while. And then what? Then the cycle just starts over. And we said, well, we don't think she did it on purpose. You know, what's her doing? He said, well, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do because in this case, most likely she would spend maybe another year in a mental institution and she'd be on some meds. And then even if they forced her to take the medication, it could probably only be for a year. And then after that, it's free game. They're like, she'd probably be like 21 when everything's already done with 22. That's more than enough time to have a couple babies again. Just start the process over. Maybe worse this time. Maybe better. We don't know. They said, or we can have her sign a plea agreement because in the end, there actually is no guarantee that that's what would happen, but most likely. So they said we could try to get her to sign a plea agreement 20 years in prison with probation for the rest of her life. Mm Mm-hmm. So he said, what do we do? Do we leave her in there? Maybe she matures more, gets a job in there, gets her GED. I did a lot of research on my own. And, you know, a lot of uh, people who have mental issues as they get older, you know, it kind of levels off a little bit or gets worse. But, you know, at least all their hormones are kind of leveled out. You know, they're an adult now. You know, they've had enough experiences to kind of combat the thoughts of like right and wrong. You know, so we're like, well, okay, then maybe we should just do the 20 years. No chance of early release. She would be, I think, 37 or 38 when she gets out. Okay. And then she's still middle age, not even in her 40s yet. And she can live the rest of her life, maybe, if she's normal. Right. So that's the hard part. So we know it wasn't on purpose, but we convinced ourselves to convince her to take the plea agreement because the only other option was maybe get out. And then when she did sign the plea agreement, then in town, everyone's like, oh, she should be in there for life. Why did, why did they offer her a plea agreement for only 20 years? It was a huge ruckus in town. You know, like she got off with murder. Who can kill two little kids and only get 20 years in prison? People are not logical about it. They, they just want an eye for an eye and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, but no one knew like, okay, well, how about this? How about we would have let it go to trial and she gets out and in four years, she's back in town running the streets. Right. Is that better? You know, and obviously people didn't know that. So, you know, it was frustrating. Like almost everyone in town is Facebook friends with each other because everyone knows each other. Mm-hmm. So I'm just seeing all this on Facebook and it was pretty tough to see. And then obviously I was part of convincing her to do the plea agreement and I approved it because, you know, it's part of the victim's advocate and all that. So it's like, are people going to understand you know, like, do I come out and say, hey, this is what we did? Yeah, it's hard, especially since all eyes are on you already. Yeah. So, I mean, some people, there's no justifying it. Like, well, my sister made up lies saying that my grandparents are watching them. My grandparents started getting death threats. And Oh, God. I know. There's just crazy people who latch on to one part of the story, which was completely false. Mm-hmm. But at a certain point, you know, you kind of just got to let people talk and just quit trying to be the police. Whenever you see a post about it, quit trying to make a comment on there people still have their own opinion whether right or wrong so you know it got to the point where we just kind of got desensitized to it but i think what you did initially was was really smart the the very long post you did explaining the whole situation i i yeah. think that probably deflected a lot of the public's blame or ire or whatever they wanted to aim at the family 
Yeah. And I mean, I felt I had to because I started hearing a bunch of rumors and with Britney saying so many lies and no one really put out a statement. Obviously, we had interviews and stuff, but like I had to write something. And I felt since everyone's friends with me on Facebook in town, the only people that I cared really who knew the story was people in town. So that's why I wrote that post. And honestly, I wasn't even going to write the post. I was just tired of explaining that to everyone. A lot of people would call me, private message me, and I was tired of copy and pasting. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put this on my Facebook wall. If anyone has an issue with it, then they can message me. But this is the story. This is what I know. This is Brittany's life. This is it right here, all laid out. Read it. If you don't want to believe it, don't. You know, but this is, from my end, what I've seen. This is what we've seen from our eyes. You know, I tried saying, you know, a little history on her. I tried saying at the time what we thought happened, you know, just trying to clear the air a little bit. It was very honest. I think it really, it must have helped a lot. I mean, it's hard to say since you don't know what would have happened if you hadn't said it, but it really, I think it did. It had to have helped a lot just to kind of give the family's perspective because a lot of times you don't get that because it's just too hard for people to talk about it. Well, like people say, you know, there's three sides to a story, our side, her side, and the truth. All we can say is our side. That's how we saw it. We may never know. Maybe she did leave the kids in there on purpose. There is a truth. Obviously, her side is not the truth, you know, leaving the kids with a babysitter. We will never know the exact truth, um, but we're pretty close. And a logical explanation is what I said earlier. You know, she went to work, left them in the Almost any lie she ever made in her life, like even in prison, she made up a lie in prison that my grandpa died and she started calling family members and obviously she's calling family members who are not in prison. So we know he's alive. Like, why are you doing this? And I was like, here's what's happening. She probably got a girlfriend in there. That girl broke up with her and she wanted some sympathy. She wanted people to feel bad for her and she will do anything possible to get a sad reaction out of someone, mad reaction or any reaction that she wants. So I said, this is probably what happened. She wants people to feel bad for her because when, when do you feel bad for someone the most? When their parent dies, right? So I said, this is what she's doing. They're like, why are you making up this lie? We all know he's alive. And then finally she came out and she's like, oh, well, my girlfriend broke up with me in here. Everything her whole life, it, it became easy to, to know what she was lying about, to kind of use context clues and kind of, you know, see the whole situation and use her brain. Like I can almost like, log into her brain and kind of think of what she was thinking when she made each decision. Um, and I was rarely wrong, very rarely. So that's why when the detectives first asked me like what I think happened and I explained to them everything, I said, I know her. I can usually know why she does something. And I told them that story. They didn't even believe me at first. Like, no, that's not like, that's so stupid. You know, that's, they just wanted first degree murder, you know, like who, who can fathom that someone who sounds so, cause at this point they've already talked to her, who can fathom someone that sounds so intelligent would do something so stupid, you know, like leave their children in a car and they never call all day to check, you know, but she didn't call all day to check on them because she thought she was going to get yelled at and get scolded because in her mind, the absolute truth was my grandpa already got him out of the car and she's just waiting to be scolded, you know, for doing something so stupid. And then I told them that. And then, you know, then they started latching onto that story because I go, okay, well, actually, it's pretty hard when someone already has an idea in their mind what happened and like that's all that makes sense something so like after explaining it all now it probably makes sense to anyone listening to this right um it probably makes sense how we could come to that conclusion and how everyone else did but at the time it's very hard and without hearing any backstory all the other stuff it's hard to fathom that that is all that happened you know so simple so stupid uh but in reality it, it, Something simple happened, but from a very complex situation of all the backstories, the complexity of it. But when the time finally came, when I was right, and I said, these kids are going to end up passed away somewhere, dead somewhere, kidnapped, or something extreme is going to happen. When the time finally did come, it was such a simple explanation of her trying to go to work. You know, it's just hard to fathom it. You know, you almost think like she had to have done it on purpose. Like who can do something so stupid? Like it had to have been done on purpose. Like there has to be something else. Yeah. Uh, but there's really not. People want someone to blame, but it's not that easy. Things are not black and white. Yeah. And it's so sad because, like you said, it is so simple and, and it was so predictable. But it was just the convergence of factors on that particular day that just ended in disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, initially, I didn't know that was her first day at work. You know, I lived an hour and a half away. I didn't. She always had something crazy going on. She had a new job every month. You know, if, if your sibling had a new job, you're going to know about it. You know what I mean? But with her, 
I don't know. You kind of take it with a grain of salt when she tells you, and he's like, hey, I'm getting a new job. Okay. Ooh. You know, your fifth new job of the summer. Okay. So, you know, I didn't know she had a new job, you know. So when I first got the news, I was just a million things going through my mind. Like, what could have happened? How could this happen? Why so late? Like, what's happening? And then once I started hearing the news of, like, she was at work through the day, hearing a couple other sides of the story, then it, like, then it all made sense in my head. And that's when I told the detectives. And, you know, at the time, no one believed that it could just be that simple. Uh, even at the time, even I was like, well, I know I've usually been right, but am I right this time? You know, am I maybe defending a murderer? I was confused. You know, it's still my sister. It's still my niece and nephew. I want, I don't care if it ends in her going to prison for murder. You know, I just want the truth. Like a lot of prosecutors, they don't care who the culprit is. Everyone listen to True Crime Podcasts. They'll try to the ends of the earth. They don't want to lose the case. Even if it means like they know they have the wrong guy. You know, they're still just going to keep pushing it, even even if that means the actual murderer is out and about. But still, you know, you can't lose. So trying to convince these people who already have in their mind the truth that, you know, it's not the truth. And, you know, then thinking back to myself, like, am I trying to convince myself that it was an accident? And then I started thinking, like, could she have done it on purpose? But it just didn't make sense if she wanted it on purpose. And she knows my grandpa was went to the store. Well, if you're trying to kill two kids, why would you lock it in a vehicle where in 30 minutes, someone's going to be out there? No one dies in a car in 30 minutes at eight in the morning. Why would you do that? She didn't ever really seem to have the malice, though, did she? No. I'm So to this day, she's never. So someone who's extremely mentally ill, like doesn't show proper feelings. So she wouldn't cry in court. And people were saying a lot of that. So her, her first court appearance, she was there just straight faced. So everyone's like, oh, she did it on purpose. And I'm like, she doesn't cry. She never cries. And if she does cry, that is fake. And she's a good actor. I don't think even in this situation she can cry. And I've never even heard her cry about it either. You know, so they put a mask on her because it was COVID. You know, masks were a thing. And then even before that, they were saying she was sick or something. So they always had a mask on her. So you couldn't see her lack of facial expression. Even to this day, I haven't talked to her in probably about a year. But last time I did talk to her, I mean... She loves it in there in a weird way. So she's always been the type to where she just wants to exist. In her perfect life, it's food's given to you. Uh, you don't got to worry about rent. You don't got to worry about a job. You just hang out with friends and just exist. She doesn't have the mental capacity to think, okay, I need to go to work. Like that stuff comes later, but I need to make money to pay rent. This is the responsible thing to do. In her mind, what she wants is just to hang out. So in prison... She has everything given to her. She's made really good friends in there in her mind. It's perfect in there for her. Like that is, it sounds weird, but I've never heard her this happy. Like whenever I talked to her on the phone, she'd be like, Hey Vinny, how are you? Like super happy. She sounds like the happiest I have ever heard her. She's thriving. She's definitely thriving. there. Like I said, she got her GED. She has a little call center job in there. Because like I said, she sounds intelligent. So they put her in a call center. There's a call center for the women inmates here in Arizona. So she loves it. And she sounds happy. So, you know, it kind of puts me at ease. You know, I did feel bad trying to convince her to take a plea agreement. You know, and then they were saying, you know, a woman like this who caused harm like that to two children in prison, it doesn't end well. You know, and I was like, well, there is a chance she could get killed in there for this accident. Sure. Yeah. That's always a possibility. But what's the other alternative? Get out and she kills again or puts everyone else through the ringer again of just stressing everyone out so badly. But hearing her and they're so happy and knowing what she wants in life is just to exist and have friends. In her mind, that's perfect for her. Yeah, she's locked up. She can't go to like the beach, but like everything else is perfect. You know, so hearing her in there kind of puts my mind at ease that, yeah, it was just a horrific accident. She still to this day hasn't said everything that happened. She hasn't even said it. And I told her, I was like, here's what I think happened. I know everyone in there tells you not to say anything because she even says she's like, my attorney says, don't say anything. Everyone in prison says, don't say anything. You know, I tell her, I say, this is what I think happened. And I told her the whole story, everything. And she's just listening. And uh, so when you're accusing her of something and it's, even if it's like, Brittany, did you leave this wrapper on the table? She would flip out. She does not want to be accused, even from something so simple. So for me to say the whole story, she just sat there and listened and then was like silent after. Even if I had one part of the story wrong, she would have been like, no, no, she can't control herself. Even though she was told not to say anything, 
she can't control herself. Sure. She would have a reaction, whether it be like, even if she didn't say no, she'd be like, mm, or make an expression or say something. So that's why I'm pretty sure that is the story. And like I said, she's never admitted it, but I mean, she's doing great in there. Uh, hopefully, you know, she doesn't get killed in there because I mean, it's still an accident. She's still my sister. She's still tough to deal with, but you can't pick your family. No one's normal. You know, there's no such thing as normal. Every brain is its own world. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as normal. She never will be that I know of, uh, unless by the time she gets out, you know, and even the prosecutor said, maybe when she gets out, the mental health system will be perfect for her. Maybe it'll be to a point where, you know, she can get the help. When the time comes and she gets out, hopefully, you know, there's something we can do, some way we can help her or she's, I'm I'm not hoping she's normal. I just hope she can cope with herself. Yeah. But in the end, the kids are gone. So maybe a day will come when she's a little normal, a little older, and it'll finally hit her. Like these two children that I have, like they're dead because to this point, it still hasn't hit her that they're gone. You know, she sees it as she's getting attention and now she's in there in a slumber party. But maybe one day, if that ever does hit her, maybe that'll help her heal or work on herself or something. I don't know. And like I said earlier, I don't mind taking these interviews because if one person hears it and reports it or inadvertently helps someone or if legislation could come out eventually, even if one kid is saved. Or maybe one kid has been saved already already inadvertently. You know, you never know. What if that kid grows up to cure cancer or become the next president of the United States and creates world peace? Or you don't know. So that's why I do these interviews. Maybe in the future, I'll work with someone. I have been reached out by someone to go over some legislation and stuff, but I haven't really gone through with it yet. Well, and what you're doing with your podcast, maybe you inadvertently have saved a life by now. You know, you, you never know. Like you said, if one kid can be saved or, or even, you know, just to raise awareness and people are more vigilant, that's what really matters. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us what you remember about Aki in Brooklyn? Man, Aki was such a happy kid. Always happy. He can face plant. Like I said, we all said he was a little top heavy. Uh, he could face plant, get a huge knot on his head, and he's still just laughing and running around and playing. And his little sister, which she didn't even get to, when she died, she never even walked yet. So uh, another thing, you know, a lot of people take it for granted, the little things. Like she never even got to walk. You know, she never even knew what it was like to walk or run or jog or skip or play. She just crawled. But even then, she was always crawling around, following him. Man, that kid, he he, he always wanted to follow my grandpa. Like one time, my buddy Charlie was over there with me, and we were helping my grandpa work on the car, and it was it rained the night before, and there were some puddles, and he was out there in his little onesie pajamas, and my grandfather's like, hey, called my grandma's like, hey, can you try to get him inside? We need to get some shoes on him because he's out here in these puddles, and it's Arizona, so there's just thorns on the ground. Can't walk five feet without getting pricked in the foot by a thorn. And this kid didn't care. He just wanted to be out there. And we kept putting him inside. You know, we were trying to work. So, you know, I kept putting him inside. He'd run back out, you know, run in the puddles, get thorns in his feet. He'd fall down and be, oh, you know, like we had to pull the thorns out of his seat and put him back inside. And then he'd run back out, (laughs) you know, just, just a typical happy kid. But like I said, unfortunately, Brooklyn, she was too young to really make a lot of those memories. So a lot of the memories we have of her is holding her and she was cute and she was never really old enough to show a personality all that much. They were both super happy, normal kids considering their life. They were too young to realize that what they were being dragged through, they just, the one person they trusted was leaving them in the car, knowing it was bad, but didn't care. The one person they trusted the most was hurting them, whether inadvertently or, you know, on purpose. We don't know all the things she ever did with them, whether on purpose or without realizing it was bad, but you know, they were just oblivious to it, you know, no matter what, even up to the end, when you've seen them with her, they were so happy. She was still their mother. I mean, I'm glad my grandparents got to raise them for a while because I don't know what happened behind closed doors with those kids. She may have been neglecting them and abusing them to a a severe point, but you know, at least when they're at my grandparents' house, they definitely had unconditional love and grew up the way we did. And, you know, we had a big yard and it was free range outside. We get to play and Like a lot of people talk about living in the old days, like getting just to go outside and play on your bike. That's how we grew up. And that's how those kids were growing up. You know, they were outside of my grandfather. You know, I'm glad my grandparents took care of them. 
Because if anything, we know they, they at least received love and affection and care and a good childhood when they were there. Because like I said, we can't prove what went on behind closed doors with anything. Um, but we at least know that they were treated good over there and they were super happy there. I just feel bad for them. We're always talking about them. My sister has a million videos of them. And, you know, we got to think of the good times and try to think of the positive things that could come out of it. And I remember my uncle Victor, the one who last died, he said he's like, even in the worst tragedies, you never know, but something good can come out of it. Even in the darkest times when you don't know and you can't imagine how good could come out of the situation, something positive could result from it. And that could be some laws changed. Maybe someone hears a story or sees a story and, you know, says, hey, I know someone who leaves their kid in the car sometimes or, you know, or even just awareness. It's hard to imagine how positive it could come out of something so tragic, but it may have already. We just don't know. And with you doing these podcasts, being proactive and getting the word out and all that, then, you know, that is helping to ensure that something positive does come out of it. We appreciate that. I told my sister I was going to be doing this podcast, but she's super emotional. And in every interview she's tried to do, it just, she's a very emotional person. And it's a little tough for her to do the interviews or talk about it. It's, it's hard for some people to talk about it for sure. That's why I, I give you a lot of credit. You've, you have talked about it a lot and it's, it's admirable because it's got to be difficult. Yeah. And I mean, it gets easier to talk about it because then when you start telling yourself, you know, I'm not just talking about it to talk about it. I'm also talking about it for awareness. You know, maybe it'll keep it from happening again. So I don't mind talking about it. We still think about the kids literally every single day. Every time we talk, they come up or when I take my daughter to my grandparents' house, they were buried down the street at the cemetery. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and giving us the whole story because it's, I think every part of this story is so important. You know, there's so many pieces that fit together and, and so many different things can be cautionary tales, but all together, it's just definitely one of the saddest things that I've ever heard. And, and your family's been through so much. So I wish you guys all the best. And I sure hope that you don't have to deal with any more tragedy. We appreciate what you're doing and appreciate the kind words and just trying to get through it day by day and year by year. And, you know, eventually the time's going to come where we have to deal with my sister getting out. But you know, in the meantime, we can just hope that it all works out. Huge thanks again to Vincent for taking the time to talk to me about Lorenzo and Brooklyn and how their loss and Brittany's actions have affected his family. My heart goes out to the Velasquez family for the many tragedies they've been through, and I wish them all nothing but peace and happiness going forward. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone. <laughs>